generation that sees and seeks your face, oh God of Jacob, oh God, let us be that generation that sees and seeks your face, oh God of Jacob. Father, there's, there's not a more important prayer that we could pray this morning than that we would be a people who seeks after you and in the very best way that we can, never tries, never desires to replace you with anything else in our life. Now, God, we know that that's what you would have from us, but we also understand that it is in our nature to try to worship other things, to try to seek other things. And so, God, we pray this morning that you would really just convict our heart and challenge our heart about making you the number one priority in our life, that, that we would take all of our direction, all of our leadership, all of our strength would come from our relationship with you and from a dependency on you and from surrender to you. God, that is the prayer. That, that I'm confident that you would want from us today. And so, God, I pray that we might be pleasing to you in that. I pray that we might be obedient to you in that. And now as we come to you and, and as we seek your word and we seek direction from your word, learning how to follow you, how to, to stick closely beside you, let your plans and your thoughts be our thoughts. Father, I pray that, that we might be pleasing to you in all of that. God, we love you so much. We thank you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Be seated. It's good to see you this morning. I missed you last week. I know you guys missed me last week, right? Uh, you did not wake up and, and turn on the news and celebrate the fact that snow had fallen and that there were no church services. I know you didn't do that. Uh, I know that you, you wanted to be here. You just, you just couldn't make it, right, with the, the roads the way they were. So that means that today you are ready for twice as much preaching as you would have been last week, right? You guys are ready for at least a, an hour or so, right? What, what all the nervous, uh, the nervous discussion? No, no, we won't do that to you. But I, I will tell you, I'm, I'm excited to be before you and excited to share with you. And uh, if, Let me just say this before we jump in. If, if you're a guest this morning, welcome to Oakdale. We're so glad to have you. We're all about you this morning. We want you to, to feel like this is a place that you can come and worship and hear from God and experience. God and uh, do something for us. This really helps us out. And the pew back in front of you is a little card. Uh, it's a card that, that asks for just a little bit of information. You drop that uh, at the uh, welcome table, the outreach table rather, out in the foyer. And uh, it just helps us know a little bit about who you are and how we might be able to minister to you. It's not one of these things where you're going to get 10,000 you know, emails or 10,000 pieces of, of mail in your mailbox. It's not like that. Uh, we just need a, a way to know who you are and how we might be able to, to take care of you, minister to you and to your family. And I'll be out at the outreach table after the services over this morning. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, I would love to do that. So come by and introduce yourself to me and, and let me know who you are. Are and, and so that we can uh, get to get, put a face with a name and, and get to welcome you here at Oakdale. Now let me let me start this morning. We're, we're going to uh, we're going to be in Colossians chapter three. So if you've got your Bible, I'll give you a fair warning. Go ahead and find Colossians chapter three. Uh, my community group that, that I'm a part of, we've been studying Colossians. In fact, I think we finished up that study today. It's been a really good study. I've learned a lot from it and uh, gave me a little bit of inspiration for what we're going to talk about today. So find Colossians three. Otherwise, we're going to have this. Scripture on the screen behind you. Also, uh, inside your, uh, your bulletin this morning, you'll find your message notes, and I want to encourage you to use those. Take those out. There's some fill-in-the-blanks there. That'll kind of help you keep up with me and know uh, pretty much where I am at. Before we start, though, let me ask this. Let's take a little poll. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the social media platform Twitter? How many of you know, have an idea of what Twitter is? All right? Good. It looks like about half. Uh, how many of you actually have a Twitter account? A little bit less. How many of you actually use Twitter on a fairly consistent basis? 
All right, some of you do. Great, that's that's perfect. Now, uh, I, I I you know I've been familiar with Twitter, but I've kind of resisted Twitter for a while. Twitter is a little bit like Facebook. Um, uh, it's a, a social media platform that allows you to kind of to post your thoughts and pictures and things like that, and then you're able to follow people who do the same thing. Other people are able to follow you. Are we, are we able to to pull this up? This is my uh, this is my Twitter. Why are you laughing? That's not funny. There's nothing, there's nothing funny about that. What, what exactly are you laughing at, Mark? Is there something that catches your eye? I just love that you have Twitter. You just love that I have Twitter. Like, I'm so old and decrepit. I don't have it. Oh, okay, all right. Mark says he didn't have one. Well, let me give a disclaimer. Before Mark gets real impressed with my Twitter account, you'll notice that I do have, I, I, I have 21 people I'm following. I've got 21 followers. But I have zero tweets, okay? So I've never, I myself have never tweeted, that's what we call it, that's what we, we Twitter users call it. I've never, I've never tweeted, I've never put out a, a message or a picture or anything like that. And so today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that for the first time. Now you do that on your computer or you can do that, you know, on your, on your uh, cell phone. And so I've got my, my Twitter uh, app here and I'm going to do two things. I've got a little message and I'm going to take a picture. Are you ready for this? Of you. This is, no, this is not my Bible app. It's not my Bible. I can't get all of you. Hang on just a second. Stay there. Don't move. No, no. It doesn't have anything to do with that. Alright. Alright. Some of you are not going to make it in the picture but I need you to smile. Are you ready? I need you to look interested. I need you to look like you care. Here we go. One, two, three. Okay, I, I took a picture. We'll see what happens now. All right, so I, I took a picture. I hit use picture. Uh, I hit done. I've got a message. My message, let's see what happens when I post this. It says tweet and nothing happened. Isn't that how it, it kind of works? Okay, now, there it goes. Now, now it's up. Justin's going to refresh. i got one tweet. Can you show us the tweet, Justin? You like my username? JFO for real, right? All right, so it says, No place I'd rather be on a sunny morning than with my closest friends, and there you are. How about that? Now, right, right, yeah, it's like, I don't really know. Okay. Now here, here's what I want to here's what I want to really show you, Justin. If you can, can you go back and, and show my uh, the people that I am following? Can you go back and do that? Uh, one of the interesting things. Now let's say that uh, later today that I, I post something you know really godly and, and spiritual and all of that, and and I and you're following me, you would be able to you'd be able to, to see that. You'd be able to see that. Yeah. Okay. All right. See. This is working. This is working. Okay, so anyway, you can see that I've got some different people that I'm following. Keep going up, Justin, if you would. Stop. No, keep going up. Stop right there. Now, I've got, uh, uh, I see Robbie Wheeler, Eric Evans, DJ Carney, Billy Graham as an example. So let's say Billy Graham, he puts out a, a tweet every couple of days. Just, I mean, pretty much anything Billy Graham says, I'm, I'm up for that. Okay, Kevin Durant, all that stuff. You guys, work. With, stay with me here for just a moment, okay? Hackbarth, please stop. You don't give the guy with ADD the controls to the... But, but here, here's the deal. Billy Graham tweets out something, and, and I'm interested in what he says, and I'm able to follow that. And he, can, he gives me some thoughts and, and some insight maybe into his relationship with God. I'm, I'm also following Barry Switzer, which please don't pull his up, because sometimes his language isn't exactly church appropriate, okay? So I, I follow different people, and, and they give me their thoughts or their pictures or their insights or whatever the case may be. There, I also, now if you'll scroll, scroll down for me, Justin, down, the other way. There you go. Or up, I guess. I'm sorry. Right there. You notice I'm following God Almighty. Okay? And, and uh, so God Almighty every day uh, will tweet out something. You know, hey, don't forget, I'm the most important thing in your life. And you need to be looking for leadership from me today. And uh, that's just a little reminder. Now, just so we're all clear, that's not actually God Almighty. That is someone who is calling themselves God Almighty. And I will delete them as soon as we're done. But I just wanted to give you an example because think about this. 
What if, some of you are like, I, I would never, I will never, right? Twitter, give me a break, I'm not going to do that, it's crazy. What if I could follow God, the real God, the one God, the true God, and every day He could send me out some direction for my life, some guidance for my life. I just hit follow, and every day I would at least know that I was going to get one or, or two or three messages from Him that would show me some things I need to know and need to do and the ways I need to go and, and the way that I need to act. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be cool if it were that simple to be able to follow God. Just hit that button and every day I'm receiving the instruction that, that He wants me to have. Now, is it that simple? It's really not, is it? it? It really just doesn't work quite that easily. One of the most often questions that I get asked as a pastor is how do I figure out God's will for my life? How do I understand what it is that God wants me to do in a given situation? How do I understand what it is that He wants, the kind of person He wants me to be, or where I'm supposed to live, or whatever the case may be? And so every year, I try to do at least one series that attempts to answer the questions like, God, what is your plan for my life? Do you even have a plan for me? And if you do, how am I supposed to know what that plan is? And so over these next five weeks, we're going to try to answer some of those questions from God's Word. Now, if you grew up in church, and many of you did, but some of you didn't, if you grew up in and around church, you may have learned from an early age that God loves you and that He has a plan for you, right? You, you probably learned that in VBS, like we talked about this morning, or you learned it in Sunday school as a kid. God loves you and He has a plan for you. Maybe if you didn't grow up in church, that, that may not be something that you spend a lot of time thinking about. But either way, most people will spend a lot of their life wondering, what does God want from me and for me? It's kind of like when you were about to graduate from high school and the school counselor or maybe the college advisor called you in and, and they asked you, what are you going to do? What is it that you want to do with your life? Are, are you going to learn a trade? Uh, are you going to go to college? Uh, if you're going to go to college, which college are you going to go to? And if you're going to go to college, what major are you going to pursue? You guys remember that? Funny thing being that they asked all those questions like we actually knew the answer to them, right? We just kind of nodded our head and we didn't have... Most of us, many of us didn't have a clue what we were going to do. Probably for some of us, you know, at that point in our life, we tried to kind of bring God into the equation. God, what should I do? Where, where should I go to school? What am I supposed to be? Maybe when you graduated, you thought things like, God, what city am I going to live in? How do I figure out which job to take, God? Or, or what do I do if I can't find a job, God? God, how do I know if I found the right person to marry? Do you guys remember asking some of those questions throughout your life? I see some heads nodding yes. And, and if you're a, a student, you know, if you haven't asked these questions, I, I promise you, you will at some point. Because it's around that time in life where we typically start thinking about this idea of God's will. And we think of it as more of a mystery than a certainty. And I think one of the reasons we feel that way is that determining God's will feels sort of like trying to listen to a weak radio signal. Have you ever been driving down the road trying to listen to a radio station that was kind of going in and out? You know what I'm talking about? One minute it's clear, the next minute it's fuzzy, and you're only picking up every fourth or fifth word of every second or third sentence. Doesn't trying to figure out God's will sometimes feel like that in your life? I, I'll be honest with you, it does for me. We ask questions like, what do you want to, me to do with my life, God? And then we kind of squint our eyes, you know, real hard, and, and, and we try to tune out all the static that, that we hear coming through. What, what, what was that, God? Cash out my college fund and buy a snow cone stand? It, is, is, that what, is that a good idea, God? Wait, wait, wait. Oh, 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 oh drop out of school and spend a year hiking through Europe? Really? Should I do that? Wait, 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 wait. Sell everything I own and become a missionary in Africa? That, that, that can't possibly be right. Is, is, that, is that what I heard? <laughs> See, it almost makes us wonder, if there is a God and He has a great plan for my life, like we learned in Sunday school, why is it so hard to figure out? Right? Why does it seem like it's such a mystery to us? I mean, come on, you read the Bible, and God was talking to people all the time, right? 
Moses got a burning bush. Noah got a rainbow to, to know that he had done the right thing. God even spoke through a donkey one time. And I can't get a little bit of help here, God, on knowing if this is the right person to marry. So here we are, smack dab in the middle of a complicated life, many times with really with no clue as to what we're supposed to do next. And it makes us think, am I, am I doing something wrong here? Is there some information that maybe I haven't been told about how this thing works, this whole thing with God's will? It just seems to be a big, frustrating mystery to me. Now that may not be something that you're comfortable telling other people you feel, but listen to me, I promise you, there are a whole bunch of people who feel exactly that way. Maybe you can relate to that. Maybe you find yourself at a crossroads today in terms of God's will. God, I've got three job opportunities. One of them is in another city. Which one do I choose? Or I have no job offers. God, what am I supposed to do? God, this is our dream house, but I don't know if we can afford it or not. Am I making a smart investment or am I being irresponsible? Ever had that conversation? Right? Or God, uh, do I find a nursing home for my mom? Or do I move her in here with my family? Or, or maybe you've never really factored God into your decision making at all. But you're here today because you're hoping that maybe church or God or something can help you make some sense out of this complicated life you're living. Well, no matter where you are in that process, let me give you both the premise and the promise of this series that we're going to be working through over these next five weeks. All right, It's there at the top of your notes. Just write in a couple of words here. First of all, the premise of the whole thing is that God loves you, just as I said before, and He has a plan for your life. Most of us, if we grew up in church or around church, we learned that pretty early on. God loves you and He does have a plan for your life. Here's the promise. He wants you to know what that plan is. Alright? That's the good news. He has promised that He wants you to know what that plan is. Now today we're going to kick this off by going to God's Word, the Bible. We're going to try to find out what God's will is for our life. And believe it or not, the Bible actually has a lot to say about how to figure out God's will. According to the Bible, all right, there, and this is just a sample, but according to the Bible, here's the list of things that are God's will for your life. Are you ready? All right, take a deep breath. Here we go. You are to... Pray without ceasing, give thanks in everything, rejoice always, submit to authority, and avoid sexual immorality. Don't hate, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, and do not go with girls who do. <laughs> you are to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You are to be fair, be gracious, be forgiving, be honest, be bold, be humble, be encouraging, be a servant, be saved, be a witness, be a light, be an example, and be filled with the Holy Spirit every single day of your life. Any questions? Can we just go home right now? Because we got it, right? That's it. I mean, that, that's, that's the list. That covers everything. You got it. Good. Good. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. I think we'd all agree that's a good list. But I also think we'd all agree there's something about that list that is sort of emotionally unsatisfying, isn't there? In terms of knowing God's will. Right? Because we look at that and, we, and it feels like God is answering specific questions with general answers. I, I know He wants me to be a light. I know He wants me to be faithful. I know He wants me to be committed. I need to know if I turn left or right over here. That's what I need to know. So God, why are you giving me general answers to the specific things that I need to know? Did God just sort of set the ground rules and now it's up to us to figure everything else out? Well, here's the good news. God is actually very, very interested in the details of your life. But we're never going to get those details until we understand God's fundamental answer to the question, God, what is your will for my life? And that's what we're going to try to determine today. Now, to do that, we're going to go to a passage of Scripture, as I told you, from the book of Colossians, which is really a letter to the church in the city of Colossa by the Apostle Paul. And in this letter, Paul points this young church towards the fundamentals of our faith. Now, we're going to go to Colossians 3 in just a moment, but before we do that, let me back up and read you something from Colossians chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 9 first. All right, this kind of sets the stage for what we're going to learn. Here's what he says in, in chapter 1, verse 9. 
He says, since the day we heard about you, he's writing to this church. He says, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you, listen, with the knowledge of His will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work. This is the results of knowing God's will. Growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of His people in the kingdom of light. Now, I know that's a lot, but, but just think about it this. Here's what Paul is saying there. This is your goal, that you would become a growing, maturing, fruit-bearing follower of Christ who brings glory to God by the way you live your life. Now, we might say to that, okay, Paul, we agree with you. We're not disagreeing at all. But how? Right? Remember, we've talked about the yes but how? How, God? I mean, how, do we, how, Paul, how do we do this? Show us the fundamentals of the faith. Paul says, I'm so glad you asked how. Let me show you. Now we go to Colossians 3, verse 1. Listen to what he says. Colossians 3, verse 1. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So the first fundamental of faith that we're going to talk about today is that you must set your hearts... You must set your heart on things above. In other words, as a Christian, your eyes go up here. You still have to live here, right? But you put your heart, you put your passion, you put your focus, you put your priorities up there at all time. Fundamentals. When times are good, you remember where the blessings came from. Eyes up here. When things get rough, remember where the strength comes from. Eyes up here. When times are good, bad, exciting, confusing, easy, no matter what your circumstances may be, you set your heart not on those things down here. You set your heart on the things above. Then he says in verse 2, he says, Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. So the second fundamental is that you are to set your mind on things above. We set our hearts on things above. We set our mind on things above. In other words, you've got to get your heart right. And you've got to get your head in the game. Then in verse 3, he tells us why we're to do this. He tells us why we don't focus on our circumstances. Why we don't spend our time looking to the world around us for the answers we need. He says this, verse 3. He says, For you died... And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Now, wait just a second. Because I'm pretty sure, if you look at that verse, go back to that verse. As you look at that verse, I'm pretty sure that I'm not dead. How about you? If I had died, I'd know that, right? I'm not dead. I'm alive. And do you know how I know that I'm alive? Because I've got all these decisions that have to be made in my life. I've got all this responsibility I carry around with me. I, at bottom line, I don't have time to be dead. Anybody with me? Right? I, I don't have time to be dead. All this stuff I've got going on. Paul says, no, no, you don't understand. I'm not talking about physical death. I'm talking about a spiritual death. He says, going on, For you died, and your life is now hidden, or it rests with Christ in God. In other words, you're not any longer your own. You gave up putting your hope in a body that is only going to last for a few years, and instead you put your hope in a Savior with whom you're going to spend eternity. He says you died to your own life, and now your new life is not found in you. Who's it found in? It's found in Him. It's found in Christ. In another place in Colossians, Paul says, When you were dead in your sins and in your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. And, and you know, that's really what Jim Miller was showing you this morning in baptism. He was showing you death, burial, but he was showing you resurrection. Not only did Jesus die and was buried and resurrected, but we ourselves, we died to our old self and now there's a new person that comes to live in our place. So here's really what he's saying. He's saying, Christian, this is what faith looks like. Before you get all caught up in, where do I go to school? Or what career path do I take? Who do I marry? How many kids? Do we need it? Can we afford it? 
Before all of that, you've got to point your heart, you've got to point your mind in the direction it belongs. Point to the direction it belongs. Come on. It goes to heaven. All right? That's where we're supposed to be focused. Now, are those decisions that I just mentioned things that you're going to have to deal with in your life? Yes or no? Absolutely, of course. But understand, those things down here are nothing compared to the things that take place up there. And if you'll start with the fundamentals, if you'll put your focus up there, if you'll see everything through a spiritual lens instead of an earthly lens, you will not believe how that will improve your ability to deal with the stuff that you've got to deal with that's going on down here. And do you see how whether you're a Christian or not, if you don't realize that your focus is supposed to be on things above, and instead if your focus is on things below, do you see how that's going to mess with your life? Do you see how that's going to make things so much harder? Let me put it this way. There's only so much you can do to prepare for the life you live and the decisions you make and the relationships you have when your focus is down here instead of up there. All right? Then Paul says something that, that really just absolutely sums up the whole thing. And it's just six little words and he doesn't even need a complete sentence to transform our lives. I'm telling you, it, it's that powerful. Verse 4, listen to this. He says, When Christ, who is your life... Now, just, just stop right there. I want you to repeat that phrase with me. Repeat that. When Christ, who is your life... Say it one more time. When Christ, who is your life... Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? Let's go back for a minute to the question we started with today and, and that we kicked off this series with. God, what is your will for my life, right? What, God, what are your plans for my life? God, what should I do with my life? And here's God's answer. I kid you not. Listen to me. This is so important. God says, I am your life. I am your life. Third fundamental. Write it down. Christ is your life. Now, you'd think if, if, if this was as important to our faith as I'm making it out to be, you'd think all of us would already know this, right? But here's the reason there's so much confusion. Here's the reason that, that this is a mystery. Here's the reason we think God is silent more than He's vocal in our life. Because we think that God is just a component of our life. So we've got our jobs, right? We've got our careers. We've got our relationships. We've got our hopes and our dreams. We've got our homes and our vacations. All of that stuff. And, and we've got God. Do you see the little, red, the little red slice of the pie? That's God's slice of the pie, right? And so, God, if you will just bless all of this stuff in the pie, you know, because you're God and, and, and you're a component of my life, if you would just bless everything, that would be so great. I mean, I would really love that if you could do that for me. But here's the deal. And, and listen, I know if you've grown up thinking that that's the way it is, and, and listen, most of us do. So if you've grown up thinking that way, you may instantly say, wait a second, that's, that's, that is right, that is correct. That's the way it's supposed to be. Just open your heart, open your mind, set it on things above for just a moment, and, and let, me try to, let me try to make this make sense, okay? That would be great if not for the fact that God is not a component of your life. And when you begin to understand who He is and how much He loves you and what He wants to do in and through you, then and only then will you understand the answer to the question, God, what do you want to do with my life? What do I do with my life? Because what God is saying to us through Colossians 3, verse 4 is, Christian, I am your life. I'm the whole thing. You see, your focus is not supposed to be on the things around you. Our focus is supposed to be on the future. It's not, rather, it's not supposed to be on the future or on a church. It's not supposed to be on a preacher, for example. Our ultimate focus is to be on Christ, on an authentic, growing, intimate relationship with Him. And here's the incredible thing. When you and I finally come to the understanding that our, our hearts and our minds are to be on Christ and that Jesus is our life, He gives us peace for the rest of the pie. 
Now listen, there are a bunch of Christians here this morning who have experienced that in your life, haven't you? When your dad died. When you couldn't get pregnant. When you lost your job. When I could go through a whole list of things. And, and you could come back and you could tell me the stories about how recognizing that Christ is your life allowed you to have peace in the individual slices of the pie, especially in times that you probably shouldn't have had peace. Now notice something. I didn't say He fixes the rest of the pie, right? Whenever I say that you, you realize that He is the whole pie, that He then fixes the rest of it, He makes it all good, He makes it all well. I didn't say there would be no more struggle, no more distraction, no more trials. That stuff is for heaven. This ain't heaven. Amen? Okay? So that's not going to happen here. He said this instead. He said He will give us peace as it relates to the pieces of our pie. And how can He give us this peace? How can He give us direction that we need? It's not because He's a component of our life. It's because He is our life. Now, I have an idea of, of what you may be thinking. All right? you, you may say, well, that's, you know, that's great. The whole keep your eye on the prize and you know one time one day at a time with Jesus thing. That's all that's good. We could tweet that out and, and that'd be good, right? But here's the deal, you know, preacher. I can usually tell when you're upset with me when you call me preacher, right? Here's the deal, preacher. I've got decisions that need to be made. I mean, real life decisions. I've got big time decisions hanging over my head that needed to be made yesterday. I need to know what to do now. And I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And I get that. I really do. And let me tell you something. We're going to spend some time in the coming weeks talking about those very kinds of situations. But in the meantime, here's what I want to do. I want to give you some homework. Alright? I want to give you some homework. And as you go into your week, starting tomorrow, whether you've got a whole bunch of, of little nickel and dime decisions to make, or whether it's the big time, life-changing decisions that, that you've got to make, I want to challenge you to approach them the same way. Okay? I want you to set your heart and your mind on things above. Man, I can't believe He treated me this way. I am sick of being treated like that. I am just going to walk in there and I'm just going to give him a piece of my mind. But wait a minute. My mind is supposed to be where? Up there, not down here. And God, I know that you love him no matter how I feel about him. Is that not like the hardest prayer to pray right there? God, I know you care about her just as much as you care about me. I know that he is just as valuable to you as I am. But you know what? I'm yours, and I don't think he is. And I think that probably needs to be reflected in the way I treat him. So help me keep my mind on you, God, as I deal with him. Okay? Are you with me? My heart, my mind is up there. It's not down here. Then I want you to remember that Christ is your life. He is your life. He's not a part. He's not a piece. He's definitely not a component. He is the whole thing. Apart from Him, nothing matters. Apart from Him, these decisions that I've got to make, as hard as they are, they don't stand a chance of working out right apart from Him. Tell me I'm wrong about that. And do you know what happens to the question, God, what should I do with my life? When you set your heart and your mind on Christ and you recognize that He is your life, the new question becomes, God, what should I do with your life that is within me? Will you write that down? God, what, we, what do I do with your life that is within me? And I think you'd agree. That's a far more significant question than to simply ask God, what is your will for my life? Right? Tell me I'm wrong about that. God, what is your will for my life? God, what do I do with your life that is inside of me? Now, maybe you say, well, I don't really see what the difference is. 
right? I, I, I don't get it. What, what's the same thing, right? But see, it's not. It's not. One question assumes that I have my life over here separate from God, right? Remember back pocket Jesus? And, and what I need God to do is just kind of sprinkle some blessing dust over my life. And maybe He could give me a road map over here that would help me get to where it is that I need to go, right? So I, could, I can leave God here and I could go over there to His will and enjoy my life with all its blessing, right? That's God, what do, you, what do I do with my life? And the other question assumes that I don't even have a life that's separate from my Heavenly Father. Yes, I want to be in His will, but I will never even come close to His will apart from my relationship with Him. Does that make sense? And so I'm challenging you right now. I want you to spend the next week living life with that question in mind. God, what should I do with your life that is within me? What do you think? Can you do it? Are you willing to try? I guess that's the question I should ask. Are you willing to try? Are you willing to put your heart and your mind on things above and, and try to take them off of the things below? Because guess what? As much as I'd love for it to work this way, you can't just hit the follow button on Twitter and think that you're going to get what you need from God in that, in that sense. You might get what you need from me. You might get what you need from Billy Graham. You might get what you need from Barry Switzer. God forbid. <laughs> But, but you're not going to get what you need from God. The only way you're going to get what you need from God is to set your heart and your mind on things above. You know what? Let's, let's go to God right now. Let's ask Him to help us with this. Help us to be obedient to it. Pray, bow your head if you would. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we think about this, this question, what do I do with my life, God? How do I know Your will for my life? I, I'm confident this is a question we've all asked at one time or another, maybe on a, on a weekly basis, we want to know what direction do we go, what decision do we make, what choice do we make. And God, this is hard. And, and I think if we're being honest, I think for most of us, I think we would admit that, that really, truly, what we do want is we want a separate piece of the pie that is you, and we want you to sprinkle some blessings over us and the rest of our pie. And let us go our own way. But God, you have made it perfectly clear. That's not how it works. Because it's not our life. You are our life. Now, that's whether we've chosen you or not. If we've chosen you to be our Savior, if we've chosen you as our Heavenly Father, then we've got to see the pie as yours. And that's got to make a difference in the way we live. And God, if, if we haven't chosen you, if we haven't accepted You as our Savior, our Heavenly Father, then God, I pray right now for, for anybody here in that situation that they would just sort of picture the pie of their life, all the little slices, and then picture what it would mean for that whole pie to read Jesus Christ doesn't mean that you would take away the individual slices. It just means that you own them all. And you're in control of them all. And you will give us guidance and direction and strength and peace for each individual slice as it becomes necessary in our life. doesn't mean you make it perfect. doesn't mean that you always make it better. But you'd make it yours. And God, if there's one person this morning that's ready to step across the line of faith... To go from my pie to his pie. My life to his life. And choose you as, as Savior. I pray that that might happen today. I know that you've been so at work in our church over these past months. It just seems like decision after decision after decision has been made. So God, I don't want to forget that you may be working in other people's hearts today. And I just pray that whatever decisions need to be shared, that, that there'd be a confidence to do that. I love you. I'll admit I'm still, I still struggle sometimes with knowing your will. But I love you and I trust you to show it to me. 
as I surrender to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We stand. Let's stand together. I'm going to be here this morning. If there's a decision that needs to be made, won't you come? Pray with me. Share with me. Let me pray with you. And in the meantime, you pray about this commitment I'm asking you to make. Put my focus, my heart, my mind on things above, not on things below. It's His pie, His life, not my own. You praise, you sing, and worship. Let's do it. A thousand times I fail, Your mercy remains. And should I stumble again, I'm caught in Your grace, everlasting. Your light will shine with all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all faith. Your will above all else, my purpose remains. The art of losing self in just ask you, just, just take a moment right now, just bow your heads and on your own. Let me just challenge you with a question. God, what do you, what do you want from me today? How can I be obedient to you? Just take a moment and ask him. I bet the answer looks different for every single person in this place.